two of our interactive sessions and uh, I guess officially the halfway mark of the conference. So um, hopefully everyone had a great day today out the slopes. For those looking to go night skiing tonight, it is open till 7.45 the lifts. So um, that's West Mountain, the side of the mountain closest to the hotel, um, if you just didn't get enough today. Um, snow report, it's still coming, so tomorrow and Friday are both going to be good. So, um, big night's sleep, eat breakfast early and you'll be all good for tomorrow. Few bits of housekeeping, so the closing party will be on Friday night at 7.30 kick off at Pirate Man. I will continue to remind you all for the next couple of nights, but Pirate Man is actually located outside of the resort. So it's a 200 metre walk from the front doors when you go out towards the talking tree. I'll send um, an email on Friday with a little image so you can find it, but it's called Pirate Man. If you get lost, just ask anyone around. Um, but you go out of the resort, turn left, and it's just part of the, the little buildings there. The deal with that one is that it's uh, two hours of drinks starting at 7.30, um, and then they have a DJ playing that will go through till about midnight. There aren't any food options there though, so make sure you plan ahead to have something to eat beforehand because um, there is not any food at Pirate Man itself on Friday night. For those yet to register or pick up your certificate or if you've lost your lanyard, uh, if you want to come see Dylan or myself at the end of tonight's sessions, um, we can help you out there. And in the sort of the small break we'll have between presenters, we do have some photos to show, so please make sure you keep sending through your photos, posting up on Instagram. It's hashtag EMS Conference Service. But I think that's all from me now. Um, same setup as yesterday, we'll have two presentations, short break in the middle. And so let's hear it for our first presenter, Michael Ashbold. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Ashbold. I'm from Hobart. I'm an intensive care specialist there and work with the ambulance service as an ambulance clinician and pre-hospital retrievalist. Um, so, look, I was hoping to make this a little bit of an information talk as much as anything and pitch it at primarily at our paramedics, but also at the nursing and ED staff and so they can find out a little bit about what happens to patients once they reach ICU and how we might manage various complications that come up in the patients after ROSC. Um, the second thing it, with it really is that Happy for it to be interactive. Hopefully have a little bit of time at end and if you've got any questions, particularly related to the, how this ICU perspective relates to pre-hospital, feel free to raise your hand and we can answer them at the end. But also if you've got a burning question in the middle, feel free to interrupt. Um, so look, we could, we could look at a case, for example. Um, if we imagine that this is a 57-year-old guy, previously well, riding to work, had a witness cardiac arrest, um, some bystander CPR, 10 minute response time or 11 minute response time, three shocks, got an LMA, and then their ROSC OBS are as follows, and non-responsive to pain, spontaneous respirations, at a pretty low rate, but probably adequate. Um, pale, systolic blood pressure's kind of a bit low, just under what we'd want it, and then moderately tachycardic. <clears throat> so keeping that into perspective, what we might do is, um, I'll just turn it around, see if it stops the echo. Is that any better? Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, so we'll put it into perspective, that, taking that through the rest of the presentation. Luckily, um, there's a, quite a few good references for you guys about po what to do post-ROSC. It's interesting, like the guidelines came out again in 2020, and a number of ambulance services have already m integrated that into their CPGs, but a number of ambulance services haven't. So I just sort of picked the two that um, closest to home, I suppose, for me and from Tassie. We've got the Victorian ones and the New South Wales ones. And interestingly, the Tassie ones, we haven't actually got a post ross guideline other than managing shock as a separate entity to, to managing um, at post-arrest. But <laughs> there's some really good information in there. But what we might talk about now is the guidelines themselves and how they came about and how they then got integrated into these CPGs. There's also a few, even with the guidelines, is there's a few unanswered questions, um, and with your CPGs especially. Um, so let's look at, say, an AP crew attending the, uh, the, this patient that we've talked about. Um, they're spontaneously breathing. So how do you know what an adequate respiratory rate is? Is it going to get better if you augment them with the BVM? 
Are you going to overventilate them if you augment them with the BVM? Do you have your entitled CO2 connected to the BVM perhaps? Um, but then you've got leaks and things like that, and now you're getting a true reading. So the guidelines don't really um, give you good information on that. <clears throat> Should you titrate the oxygen in flow? And if, if so, how do you titrate it after ROSC? Should you do um, rapid transport or stabilise them on scene? A number of ambulance services are saying, oh, look, they've got to be stable for 10 minutes before you move them. And other people are saying, quick, get them to hospital so they can get their um, STEMI fixed. So there's a little bit of a um, difference in guidelines and difference in, in policy, and it really comes down to your experience as paramedics and EMS providers to work out what the right thing to do is. And then in lots of the CPG, it says take them to a cardiac arrest centre, and, and we haven't really defined in the literature what a cardiac arrest centre means. Does it mean a centre that does PCI 24 hours a day, which most people seem to think that that's what it means? Or is it a centre that does PCI but also offers cardiothoracic surgery, ECMO, and all the rest of it? Um, so, for example, in Melbourne, if you have an arrest outside St Vincent's Hospital in the city, <coughs> do you take them to St Vincent's, which has all of that stuff, or do you take them to the Alfred, which is the ECMO centre? So it's a little bit tricky to decide, and maybe if they've got severe sh cardiogenic shock and an anterior STEMI, which one do you choose? Do you get them to an ECMO centre, where they might need that down the track, or do you get them to the cath lab the quickest at St Vincent's? So we haven't really managed to define that in the guidelines, and that's an area where we're still guided a lot by your experience and local knowledge as to what the right thing to do is. <clears throat> so then the ICP arrives, and do you switch out the LMA for an ET tube? What's the sort of benefit in that? Um, number of services do do that, and number of services don't do that. The target blood pressure, in ICU we define that as a MAP target, and in the pre-hospital setting we usually define it as a systolic blood pressure. So there's a little bit of wiggle room there because we don't actually know which one is the right one that you guys should be using. <clears throat> should you start adrenaline? Given that they've had three shocks already, and if an ICP crew had attended at the start, they would have gotten amiodarone, should you then give them amiodarone anyway after they've had ROSC to try and prevent further episodes of v VF or VT? Um, does the threshold for thromb thromb thrombolysis for STEMI change after CPR? And how long is too much CPR and how many rib fractures is too much rib fractures before you decide it's okay to thrombolize someone? And should you be going straight to the cath lab if you've got, say, a left bundle branch block or even a non-ischemic looking ECG, or should you really be waiting, stabilizing them and doing a delayed cath down the track? So all of these are really good questions. I can't profess I've got the answers to all of them but it just shows the importance of clinical experience and knowing a bit of background knowledge behind some of the physiology, behind some of the literature, behind some of the, um, the guidelines that are out there, in addition to your CPGs, so that you can make the right choices for some of these decisions. If there's time, we'll come back to these and we'll try and answer some of them if I can for you. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do is uh, look at intensive care management after ROSC so that you have an idea about what happens in the hospital. We'll look at some practice points and some evidence. We'll then let's talk about the challenges of prognostication and um, what we go through in ICU to prognosticate and work out who's going to survive, who's not going to survive, and how do we make those difficult decisions. And then we talk a little bit about the outcomes from cardiac arrest in Australia and New Zealand because the average straw poll of guys down in Tassie um, of road paramedics is a 10% survival rate. But that's probably a bit unfair in that most of the ones that don't survive, you don't guys don't start on us well. So we'll go through some of the outcomes in terms of the literature for Australia. Okay, so a little bit about how the guidelines come about. So there's an international organisation called ILCOR, which is the International Committee on Resuscitation, and it's made up of a whole bunch of representatives from all the different resuscitation councils around the world. So in Australia we have ANSCOR, which is our resuscitation council, but multiple ones throughout North America and, and Europe as well. And, and basically what they do is they meet every four or five years, they come up with a number of clinical questions that they need answered and follow the literature for five years and do some systematic reviews on predefined areas. And then they come up with some recommendations which they call uh, COST, C-O-S-T, S-T-R, co um, Committee of recommend Recommendations for Treatment and Science, something similar to that. But basically, then those recommendations filter down to the individual countries and they filter down to Australia at some point in the future and then we integrate them into our policy and then ambulance 
uh, suppose clinicians and ambulance committees look at those local recommendations and then roll them into your CPGs. So you can imagine there's a bit of a lag time. So for instance, the 2020 guidelines came out in 2020, <clears throat> then the uh, ANSCOR still haven't integrated the post ROSC recommendations from that into the local Australian guidelines. And so therefore a number of ambulance services haven't integrated them into our guidelines. Uh, a few of them have, like the Victorian ones have, but a number of them haven't. So that's a bit of a uh, discussion that you guys can have with your local uh, clinical leaders is um, if you've, this, you've got a clinical question or if you've heard something at the conference, uh, how come we aren't integrating this into our guidelines or what's your time frame for starting to think about these things into your guidelines? Um, certainly not endorsing practising outside the clinical practice guidelines, but certainly having a word offline to people and getting these questions answered is quite reasonable. Okay, so we're going to run things from, through from a sort of A, B, C, D point of view, um, looking at uh, some of the things that we do in ICU and some of the literature. So the airway is a bit tricky because it's, it's, there's not a lot of literature on airway and it's so complicated and so many individual patient factors make it into the decision, which is good for pre-hospital providers because it means you can leverage your experience to try and make the right decision and whatever decision you make is probably the right one at the right time. And there's good ways to justify it to everybody as well. Um, certainly, from an intensive care point of view, we love receiving patients who aren't intubated so we can assess them neurologically and decide sort of their prognostic things very early. But from a pre-hospital provider point of view, sure. Um, actually, I was gonna do a straw poll here. So who here um, is an ICP, if someone put their hands up? Any, or uh, advanced uh, paramedic practitioner type thing. A couple, couple up the back. Do, or do, aside from that, who here does intubation for cardiac arrest? Anyone do? Yep. And of, of those guys, uh, is that always RSI intubation or is it often uh, non-drug non intubation? A bit of a mix. Okay. So certainly there's cold intubation and there's RSI intubation. I'm probably gonna talk about RSI intubation because that's most usually what happens in the post-ROSC situation. But certainly, yep, in, in the blue zone, it, some good things, reduces risk of aspiration. You can control the ventilation, you can measure your end tidal CO2 in a closed circuit. You can say, yep, that's what the end tidal CO2 is and turn the ventilator up and down. You can uh, save some time for the hospital staff in the cath lab if they've got a big anterior STEMI and you wheel them through and you put them on the table, the anaesthetist can pretty much start straight away and doesn't have to muck around trying to get them intubated before they do the cath. Uh, the other thing which I think is probably the, the most important is you can sedate them and safely transport them. Because often these patient, patients, once they get ROSC, they're flailing about all over the place and they're, uh, you're unable to transport them safely. They're exerting themselves severely. They're markedly tachycardic. And if they've got a, a occlusive coronary lesion that's causing the problem, they're oxygen use of their heart is going up enormously because they're sort of struggling and tachycardic and everything. And in, once you intubate them, you sort all that out and their heart rate drops. They probably get less myocardial ischemia. They probably get a safer trip to hospital. So there's, there's a quite a few pros. <clears throat> However, there's a few sort of red flags that I think you guys should think about with doing intubation in this situation is once you intubate them, once you use um, fentanyl or any other sedative, you turn off their endogenous adrenaline and therefore their vascular tone relaxes and they get a bit hypotensive. <clears throat> Most of the drugs we use for intubation have negative inotropic effects so the heart squeezes less well um, so that can also drop their bundle as well and then you change them from breathing normally with negative pressure ventilation to positive pressure ventilation in their chest so you markedly reduce their preload um, and that, that in some causes of cardiac arrest can be disastrous. So things like hypovolemic shock in traumatic cardiac arrest, and things like hypovolemic shock in, se in sepsis, um, and things like PE where you've got obstructive shock. If you, if you suddenly positively pressure people, you can cause a real problem. So I think if you think you're intubating in a trauma arrest or if you think you're intubating in a PE, just a word of caution that that can actually be quite difficult and maybe it is better to get them to hospital on some inotropes and the settled and volume replaced before you start. 
a little bit of a caution for increased time on scene. Intubation takes, uh, takes some time. RSI intubation takes even longer. In our service, we struggle to get it done in 20 minutes, with, even with practicing and drilling and stuff like that. So there is a bit of an increased time on scene. And if you've got an occlusive anterior STEMI, that's valuable time that they could be sort of getting towards hospital. And the, the last thing, which is um, if once they're sedated and intubated, it's hard to really assess them neurologically. And in the past, when they got to hospital, they got cooled down to 32 degrees. And that meant that they had three days at 32 degrees, three days in an ICU bed. And occasionally, you'd wake them up at the three-day mark and they're completely fine. And those patients might have actually not needed a three-day ICU stay as well, and all the complications that go for, that come on from that. So that's less of an issue now because we don't cool people quite that cold. But we'll talk about that in a second. So oxygenation. Uh, this is an area that Australia's done quite a lot of research on. So there's um, a number of intensive care, intensivists in Australia that are very passionate about hyperoxia causing potentially problems um, in ICU in general. And so there's uh, only published a couple of years ago was the ICU ROCKS trial. And that was in Australia and New Zealand, a thousand patients, and looked at having a conservative oxygen target of 90 to 97% versus us, the standard care, which in ICU generally is, has people saturation in that zone, but sometimes we let it rise up to over 100%, and some people sit on 100% if they've got pretty good oxygenation. So <coughs> interestingly, there's um, no significant difference overall in time on the ventilator, which was the, the predefined primary outcome. But in actual fact, they also found in some subgroups of the study, so patients with ischemic brain injury, so our cardiac arrest cohort, um, and pa patients with neurological injury, so traumatic brain injury. Um, so in that cohort, there's actually a survival benefit and less mortality if you had a conservative oxygen target. Now, the caveat to that is they actually didn't get a very big difference in oxygen exposure between the two groups. As you can see there, the red zone's the time when they spend over 97% sats. And so there's a, there's a bit of a difference between the two groups, but not a lot. Um, but even then, they, they got this mortality benefit. <clears throat> so that's, that was because it wasn't one of the primary um, outcomes de devised in the studies. That was just a hypothesis generating that, that finding. So they're actually going to go, um, the guidelines support uh, essentially keeping the SATs between 92 and 97%. <clears throat> it, so it says it's probably bad to have saturations of that are very, very high for a long period of time. And it's probably bad to have saturations under 92% for a very long period of time. So in the, it's essentially, it's a bit of a Goldilocks thing and continue doing what we're doing at the moment. <clears throat> but coming up in the next year or so, we're going to run a, the Megarox trial. So the last trial was 1,000 patients. This is going to be a 40,000 patient trial. And it's going to be powered for mortality, looking to try and see in, uh, overall in ICU, does oxygen exposure make a difference? And then the second thing is, in particular subgroups, does oxygen ex exposure make a difference? So they've predefined hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in the number three down there. Um, they've predefined that as an important group that they're going to deliberately study to see if oxygen exposure makes a difference. So that's a little bit different to what we're talking about immediately post ROS. This that's oxygen in ICU for a week down the track. Um, what about, post, what about during arrest and what about post arrest? And so can I have a set of hands? Who's seen the documentary, The Last Breath? Cool, did you like it? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I'd recommend people see it, it's on Netflix. Um, it's really, really interesting. And it's very specific to diving medicine. And if you're interested in diving and diving medicine, basically, they, <clears throat> this is deep sea saturation diving and they put these divers in a bell and they go down to 10 atmospheres. So 10 times the concentration of, or oh, actually it's exponential, so it's way, way more oxygen in their system. <laughs> but they also breathe helium as well to reduce the risk of nitrogen narcosis. But basically, <clears throat> this guy at the bottom of the um, pipe, uh, there was a separation between the boat and the diver, and they had to use their emergency air supply. And so he's breathed high concentration oxygen under high atmospheric pressure, and then it's interesting to see the result. You'll have to watch the movie and see. But 
I don't, I don't want to spoil it, spoil the surprise. But the, the, the caveat to that is, um, I guess what I'm saying is, after, during arrests where there's no circulation, you probably want the oxygen as high as you can possibly get it. And likewise, if you're in a post-ROSC period and you've got low circulation, well, again, you probably want the oxygen as high as you can possibly get it. Most of our research is looking at oxygen after that period, so two hours after ROSC through to a week in ICU. So be careful in translating oxygen literature through the pre-hospital space. Um, and I know with the ICU ROCKS trial, they tried to look with AV at doing it pre-hospital, but it just proved to be too difficult to titrate with the BVM down and measure SATs and things like that. I think if you're doing into hospital transfers or if you've actually got a really good SATs trace and they're on a ventilator, by all means, turn the oxygen down and get them in that 91 to 97%. But if, if you've got a dodgy SATs trace and or you're doing it with a BVM, it's probably just too hard and just get them to hospital with high, high oxygen. All right, now onto ventilation. So the guidelines would recommend a PaCO2 of 35 to 45. Now, that's different to an end tidal CO2. That's a, that's a, ox, that's a off a blood gas, measures the partial pressure of oxygen of carbon dioxide in the, in the circulation. Um, essentially, at the moment, we're just staying with that as the target. Um, generally, there's quite a lot of research going on at allowing people to have a higher CO2. I suppose underventilating them would be the way you'd achieve that. Uh, and there's a lot of it, there's some animal evidence and human evidence uh, measuring brain tissue oxygenation at lower, sorry, at, um, at PaCO2 of 50 or so. And they actually get better, better brain perfusion because as you drop your, uh, as you raise your CO2, you get vasodilation in the carotid arteries and in the arteries of the brain. So you get a higher amount of blood flow to the brain. So we know that from a physiological point of view, the question is, will that in increase blood flow that you get from raising the CO2, will that actually lead to better outcomes? And that's what we're going to do with the TAME trial, which is about, I think it might have already started, but it's not rolled out in my hospital or the ones that I've heard of. Um, but basically, that's an, another Australian trial that's going to look at CO2 of 35 to 45 versus 50 to 55. Uh, and they'll be interesting to, to see the results. That's a lot of promising animal and, and early human data as well. Uh, the thing, other thing I want to talk about was we're talking about a blood gas CO2. In ICU, we might measure that every couple of hours for the first little bit. That's quite different to an end tidal CO2. And I just wanted to make sure that everyone was on top of the fact that your end tidal CO2 can, is usually like a little bit lower than your arterial CO2 because there's some dead space in the lungs that's ventilated but not perfused. So the difference is that if you have someone post cardiac arrest, <clears throat> what can happen, that difference can go from maybe three to four to seven in, in young people to older people. It can go up to like 20 or 30 if someone's got severe cardiogenic shock and they've got large amounts of alveolar dead space. So our guidelines are based around the entitled CO2 in the pre-hospital pre setting, and that's quite reasonable because that's what the market that we've got. And it works for most of the time, but I'd be cautious about ventilating people at lower PaCO2s because if you're going at, at lower entitled CO2s, because if you're ventilating and it's saying 25, well, it, it could mean that their arterial CO2 was 30, which is a bit low. Um, or it could mean the arterial CO2 is 50, you just don't know. But I'd avoid getting them low, I'd err on the 35 to 40 side of things. At least then you'll know it'd be normal or high. Um, the recommendations uh, for tidal volumes of six to eight mils per kilo, there's very limited evidence to support that. It's just brought from other areas of in intensive care. Um, lots of these patients have aspiration, but they don't often have acute lung injury straight at the start. I think it's reasonable to give eight mils per kilo, and that's what I do in my practice, at least in the first little bit. And if they have lung injury, we might down it to six mils per kilo. If you give six mils per kilo to everyone, that's like, a, like giving me 400 mil, 420 mil tidal volumes. <clears throat> it's probably, it just means that you need a high, very high respiratory rate, and it's maybe less effective, and certainly less effective at, at clearing CO2. So we usually use about eight mils per kilo. Um, 
All right, and the last word of caution is um, I do the equipment for our service as well, and our ventilators just got updated with a CPR ventilator mode. I'd just be a bit cautious with those because a lot of them actually will probably overventilate your patients during a rest. Um, so there's still nothing wrong with going, sticking with what you know and giving a small number of squeezes of the bag because the last thing that you want to do in a, in a, a rested person is have a very low CO2 and that will vasoconstrict their, their, all their cerebral vessels. So you definitely don't want to overventilate your arrests. And we just don't know what happens with these ventilator CPR modes. They're all untested in humans. They're just done off the guidelines that says six to 10 breaths per minute. So interesting. All right, uh, so on to like, uh, circulation stuff. So after a cardiac arrest, usually if, you, they, if people revert and they don't have a big STEMI, they're usually fairly stable from a cardiac point of view. But over the course of the next several hours, they develop what's called post-cardiac arrest syndrome. And basically it's a combination of pathophysiology things that happen and inciting events that then cause this cascade of problems down the track. And interestingly, it's very similar to sepsis and it's very similar to major trauma. Um, and you have, in this case, the inciting event rather than being trauma is uh, ischem hypoxic and, and ischemia from hypoxia. Uh, and so you have your original injury, you have some myocardial dysfunction that takes a while, the heart takes a while to come back again after its original insult. And then you have this reperfusion injury where um, into the areas that were injured comes all new blood flow and all of the inflammatory cascade from that. And, and then you get activation of the coagulation system, just like in trauma. You get uh, increase of endothelial vasodilators, so your arteries themselves actually vasodilate as a result of the inflammation. And then you get shedding of the glycocalyx, which I'll touch on in a second, but it's really quite interesting. Uh, and then the end result of all of that is what you see in cardiac arrest, in trauma, in sepsis, is you end up with this fluid accumulation in, in your organs and you end up with circulation impairment from all the microthrombi. So that end result of that is multi-organ multi dysfunction. And luckily this doesn't happen to a lot of cardiac arrests, but certainly in our trauma population it happens very frequently. So that's the, the physiology of it. And that's what on an electron, electron microscope picture of the inside of a blood vessel. So you can see on the laser pointer, hopefully. Which one was it, Quentin? The top one? Yeah, okay, yeah. You can see that's an endothelial cell down here, and the tufty stuff up, up above it is called the glycocalyx. And basically that's a whole bunch of um, pro protein and glycan structures that are stuck to the endothelial cell by lo fairly loose connections, and it basically is it's the powerless snow between the piece and the blood vessels. Um, but it just provides, stops all the platelets sticking, it stops all of the um, red cells getting, and the white cells mi um, migrating through, and it stops fluid leaking through between the endothelial cells. <clears throat> so what happens up it, with this inflammatory response after trauma, after cardiac arrest, after um, sepsis, is this gets shed off and you end up with just the endothelial cells and the junctions in between become leaky and the fluid leaks through those junctions off into the system and then you've got a hypovolemic patient and a fluid, lots of fluid in the extra tissues. <clears throat> so that's why you might see, in, if you go back and see patients in ICU, they've got lots of fluid on board, they weigh three or four kilos or 10 kilos heavier than what they normally do. And then we spend the next th two weeks trying to get the fluid out of them. Okay, so investigation of shock after cardiac arrest. Um, so what we do in ICU, uh, we've got the luxury of time, but all these patients will have an arterial line. We actually measure, if they're really shocked, we'll measure central blood pressure, so we'll put it in the femoral artery, and sort of it gets fed up to pretty much to the base of the aorta. Um, and interestingly, you can sometimes have quite a discrepancy between peripheral blood pressure and central blood pressure in, uh, in these patients. <coughs> If they're shocked, we'll, they'll get an echo, and we'll touch on that in a second. <clears throat> they'll often get a cardiac output monitor, which we'll, we'll also talk about. And then we'll do our various treatments and, and look for the end point um, that's going to say, yes, we're doing a good job, or no, we're not doing a good job. Now, the problem is we actually don't have good measures of that. So 
We don't know, we can look at a patient and feel their peripheries and say, yep, they're nice and warm, they look well perfused. We can measure their blood tests and look at their organ function, but the lag time in that's often a day or two to really start to see changes. We can measure their lactate, and everyone's very reassured when the lactate starts to come down. But again, that's not necessarily, um, it could be a marker from the adrenaline coming off, it could be a marker from a number of things. <clears throat> um, and then we look at urine output, and there's so many factors that go into urine output, it's hard as a marker of perfusion. <clears throat> so I think that's why in ICU we use cardiac output monitors, and that way we can really say, all right, uh, intervention's making a difference for the cardiac output. But there isn't a magic result that we can say, yes, it, perfusion's improved or it hasn't improved. It's sort of a combination of all of those. <clears throat> so looking at um, some echo things, after cardiac arrest, there's a, a few things that pop up occasionally that you can only really tell with an echo. Um, so for instance, this one, let's say they didn't have a stemming ECG. It's a cr uh, longitudinal cross-section through the heart. You can see that the apex is up here this is the left ventricle, that's the mitral valve, that's the left atrium, that's the aortic valve, right ventricle there. Um, <clears throat> basically, you can see here, this wall is moving and this anterior septal wall is not moving. Or with the eye of faith, you might have to believe me, but um, <clears throat> it's sort of being pulled in by the other side. And so th this would be an example of someone that we might do an echo on and say, actually, they've got this big area of the heart that's not moving, they should go to the cath lab, definitely. It's probably a coronary cause for it. This is again the anterior wall, the posterior wall. Again, it's not thickening, not moving, it's just being pulled in by a contraction on the other side. <clears throat> a couple of other interesting things. So um, patients can get ischemic related mitral regurgitation. So this is the left atrium here, this is a jet of blood backflowing the wrong way through the valve, so it's a leaky mitral valve. And you can see here that blue sort of flash that comes about every fourth beat, quite significant mitral regurgitation. And that then presents as pulmonary edema in the, in the clinical picture. So you've got someone with shock and pulmonary edema after cardiac arrest. It's not actually a problem with their myocardial function, or it's not a massive problem with their myocardial function, it's a problem with their leaky valve. Um, we also sometimes put a, a esophageal probe down and look from the inside of the esophagus out of the heart from behind, and sometimes you get lots better pictures that way. So this is a, a transesophageal echo, um, and it's again looking at longitudinally and axially through the mitral valve at the contraction. And you can see here again, the same patient, um, not much movement or thickening of the anterior lateral wall, and lots better movement down here. <coughs> A couple of other things that can happen, um, you can get ventricular rupture. So here's a jet going of blood going that direction through the wall towards the probe into the pericardium. You can see a pericardial diffusion out here. <clears throat> here's a longitudinal picture. So that's the apex of the heart here. This is the septum, which has looked a bit bowed and unusual. It's got an um, intramural rupture here. Um, but basically there's a what's called a VSD, a ventricular septal defect, where there's blood flowing from the left side of the heart into the right side of the heart. And that's as a result of a, a, an ischemia. And then that ischemic tissue breaking and causing a leak, leak between the two chambers of the heart, which can cause a major problem because the two chambers are deliberately two chambers. They're not supposed to be one chamber. <clears throat> uh, and then you might pick up something else. So this is a cardiac arrest. Um, and you can see here, probably with the eye of faith, there's not much contraction of the right ventricle here. It's a bit sort of funny shaped, a bit oval shaped. And it's a bit dark, but you can see here an almost empty left ventricle and a massive right ventricle around the outside here. And so that's a PE echo that you would see down the track after ROSC. Yes, there's a markedly dilated right ventricle, so you can say, yep, it's a PE. <coughs> Um, looking at cardiac output monitoring, so basically we can do it two ways. We put a catheter down here through the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery and we squirt cold water in at this section here and then we measure the temperature at the end of it. And we look at the rate of change of temperature that gives you an idea about what their cardiac output is. So how quickly that cold gets diluted 
means the quicker it gets diluted, the faster the, the better cardiac output that they've got. Um, we can also do that through the, through the lungs um, with a, what's called a PICO, and this give us, gives us some other numbers. We put the square in on the right side of the heart and measure it on the left side of the, of the circulation. But with a number of algorithms, we can get some, a good idea about what the volume of blood contained in the th thorax is, what's the volume of blood in the heart, and get a bit of an idea about preload as well. So we, we use that particularly for cases where we're worried about preload. So things like burns and cardiac arrest, if it would be another example. Uh, we can also do cardiac output with echo, but it's actually quite difficult to get accurate, reliable results, and it takes a long time. And, and it's not there all the time for our nursing staff to, to monitor. So if you're needing to do it lots and lots, we probably prefer to use these in our cardiac patients. <clears throat> so talking through management of cardiac shock, um, the guidelines, the ESICM ones that I've sort of been looking at, which are probably the most up-to-date, uh, have suggested nor noradrenaline and dibutamine are probably the two drugs that we use in post-cardiac arrest. Neither of those are really used very much by pre-hospital providers. Adrenaline does similar things, but you don't get quite as good blood pressure control, and, and that's fine in the pre-hospital setting, but down the track, a day later, the patient doesn't need any more inotropy, that, uh, any more faster heartbeat. What they need is squeeze, um, and the noradrenaline is a bit more selective for just providing squeeze, but without the increasing contractility. Um, I have seen noradrenaline starting to filter into, the, into some ambulance protocols as well um, internationally, so that's probably a watch this space. I'd imagine. Um, we also use these three in ICU. Um, dibutamine is like a beta agonist, so it's a bit like adrenaline without the squeeze, oh sorry, noradrenaline without the squeeze. The milrinone is a, a calcium um, that increases intracellular calcium, and levosimendin increases calcium sensitivity. So basically, all of these, um, through various mechanisms, increase calcium and cause better contraction without causing the increase in the heart rate. Oh, sorry, the last two, without the increase in the heart rate. All right. Um, I thought this is a, probably a bit of more pre-hospital relevance. Surely amiodarone will prevent re-arrest and stabilise the rhythm, and you would have given it anyway if they hadn't shocked out, or particularly if the first crew haven't given it and you've arrived late and they've had four or five shocks, should you just give it anyway? Um, hands up who gives uh, amiodarone after ROSC in your patient if they've had a VT arrest or a VF arrest? Anyone? Not really? I've, I've, I've seen it done before and, and certainly I've been tempted to give it before and ha I've heard of other people giving it before but um, certainly the, the ARC guidelines actually say it is quite appropriate to give it after cardiac arrest, uh, after ROSC. Um, but they were in 2016, and there's been more research published since then. And most of the current 2020 guidelines and the ILCOR guidelines suggest against giving it. And the main reason is it's a negative inotrope. And when you give it fast, it can cause a drop in the blood pressure. Um, but in this, interest, interestingly, um, there's some trial evidence of different formulations of amiodarone, and there is some benefit in reducing re-arrest. But that's a watch this space thing. Um, and I know the Victorian guidelines say don't give it post-arrest. But I hope to have a chance to check everyone's guidelines. Okay, um, reperfusion. <clears throat> so should we rush to the cath lab with uh, non-STEMI? Uh, generally, the answer for that is we shouldn't rush to the cath lab. Um, there's been a few big trials. There's one called the Tomahawk trial, which I put here. Um, I think if you've got cardiogenic shock after arrest, or if you've got uh, the ischemic looking ECG that's not a STEMI, or um, if you've got other signs like markedly raised troponin or worsening troponin um, uh, or echo signs that show regional walls not working properly, you've got to have some other hint to make you go to the cath lab. Uh, so STEMI, definitely straight to the cath lab if they're stable enough and got everything sorted out. Non-STEMI, uh, better to sort out exactly what's going on first and decide if they've got any of these other markers that need to go, that mean they need an angio. <coughs> Thrombolysis after CPR, another curly topic. There's, it sort of went out of vogue in 2008, and they uh, had increased intracranial hemorrhage, no real benefit. And the guidelines said really only do it if you suspect, highly suspect it's PE, and even then there hasn't been a lot of strong support for that. 
But interestingly, it's sort of come back into some of our guidelines. And I know both the Victorian and New South Wales guidelines say, look, if you've got a STEMI and you've got ROSC, well, then maybe you should give um, thrombolysis and sort of a, a consider. But in their exclusion criteria, it says prolonged CPR as an exclusion for thrombolysis. So I think this is a bit of a grey zone. Um, <clears throat> particularly if you've got a stable patient with an inferior STEMI that's not a large area of myocardium and you're, you're 91 minutes from hospital, well, maybe you'd probably err on the side of caution and not thrombolise them. But it, it's, it's something that you probably good, call, good idea to call the ambulance clinician about and say, have a bit of discussion how far you are from hospital, how much CPR they've had, have they got obvious fractures, and then make a decision. Share, shared decision making between different groups. <clears throat> All right. I'm going uh, to skip ahead a little bit because we're um, running a bit behind schedule. But um, mechanical cardiac support for cardiogenic shock is a, is a whole topic in itself. I'll just cover what, we, what is available in a, in a number of ICUs. So uh, what we really want to do managing cardiac shock is we want to reduce the work that the left ventricle does. So by having a balloon that pumps up and down in, in the aorta, and deflates in systole, you can reduce the amount of work that the heart has to do, the amount of squeeze the heart has to give, and you reduce the pressure it's pumping against. <clears throat> That's got a balloon pump. You can also put this sort of worm drive screw thing in called an impeller that sucks blood from the left ventricle at, in a little tube through the aortic valve and then puts it into the aorta. Um, that's relatively new technology and that's sort of on its way in. It's putting it in the cath lab and increasingly people are putting that in in cardiogenic shock after, um, after cardiac arrest. Then there's VA ECMO, which is sort of what people think about when they think of cardiac, mechanical cardiac support. And that sucks blood from the right side of the heart, from near the right atrium in the SVC, sucks it out, puts it through an oxygenator, puts it through a pump, and so pressurizes it and puts it back in under pressure into the aorta. And then the blood flows retrograde up the aorta from the end of the catheter into the brain and to the rest of the organs. So you can imagine this actually drives up your systemic pressure and actually makes it harder for the heart to squeeze against and can actually cause some problems. It, it saves the brain and saves the rest of the organs, but it makes it quite difficult for the heart. So we're starting to see combinations of ECMO and impeller or ECMO and balloon pump. Um, and so watch this space for exactly what's gonna be done in the future. Steroid in cardiac arrest. Um, so we saw post-cardiac arrest syndrome involves inflammation. Steroids reduce inflammation. So maybe giving steroids is a good idea. And there's been a few trials that combined vasopressin and steroids or just steroids. But there's not enough evidence really to support steroids being used in all comers from cardiac arrest. <clears throat> what we're starting to do now is to use it for patients that have persistent shock in ICU from any cause are usually getting steroids and usually getting small doses. But we're not giving big dose steroids with the idea of damping down the immune system. Uh, there's been a recent trial, the Cortica trial that's just published recently, that also looked at a whole bunch of physiological endpoints of inflammation with a moderate dose steroid after, after cardiac arrest, and it hasn't really shown a benefit as well. So the ILCOR guidelines were saying, let's wait for the results of this trial, and the results are in, and it's not super convincing for steroids, so it's probably another steroids and ICU thing that's gonna sort of sit on the sidelines for a while. <clears throat> um, who's heard about some of the patients who have arrested in cold environments and then survived? There's, quite, there's a few of them that have been described. So there's a, an anaesthetist that fell into the ice in Northern Europe somewhere, and then got submerged and then drowned, and then was asystolic and got brought to hospital, put on ECMO and survived. And I read this one recently, um, I think in 2020, this lady froze to death in the, in the Pyrenees and had a temperature of 17 when she was brought in, asystole, no signs of life for, I think, six hours, and then went on to ECMO and made a full neurological recovery. <clears throat> we also, in cardiothoracic surgery, we cool people down to 20 degrees, stop the heart, disconnect the brain from the circulation, and then fix up the problems and then switch the heart back on again and reproduce the brain. And even at 20, 20 degrees, you don't have any ongoing residual neurological problems. <clears throat> so you can imagine the temptation to manage temperature um, to reduce the morbidity from cardiac arrest. 
so there's a bunch of trials done in the mid-2000s that had showed some promise and we started cooling people to 32 degrees. Then there's been two studies since then, the TTM trial studies that looked at 33 versus 36 degrees and then 33 versus 37.5. And the end result of that is despite getting really good differences in temperature, pretty much the same outcomes with all, the, all of the patients. <clears throat> so a number of hospitals, this is another example of um, research taking a while to filter down through to CPGs. Well, it's exactly the same in the hospital. Research happens, takes a long time to filter down to the practice. So we're, we're starting to see changes in that we're relaxing our temperature control in ICU, which makes it a little bit easier to get, um, I suppose, manage patients because they're not shivering as much and their drug metabolism is a bit easier to predict. So for lots of reasons, it's good. And, and generally now we're focused on prevention of fever rather than uh, rapid temperature drops. <clears throat> Interestingly, that probably doesn't translate to um, eCPR or ECMO CPR. So just like this lady survived because her brain was cooled during her arrest, if we can implement the temperature change, not here three hours down the track, but implement it at the arrest, well, there's still a chance that it's actually a good thing. So lots of the ECMO eCPR research is still looking at dropping people's temperature very rapidly during arrest. Uh, general ICU management doesn't differ a lot. I'm going to skip ahead on this one. <clears throat> imaging and cardiac arrest, there's lots of um, good things about doing imaging after cardiac arrest. Not only can you find the cause of the cardiac arrest in those patients that don't have a STEMI, but also you can find injuries. And there's like a 17% chance of a clinically important injury. And even from my own clinical practice, I've seen lots of patients where no one's thought about injuries from CPR. And then when you can't wean someone from the ventilator two weeks down the track, you find out that they've got a fractured sternum and bilateral rib fractures and a huge flail segment. And that's all stuff that could have been fixed two weeks ago, but now you're sort of two weeks behind the track. So it's important to, if you've got a large proportion of these patients have thoracic injuries, and it's important to start looking for them and doing a CT at some stage in the first bit of the ICU stay. <clears throat> so on to prognostication. Um, I guess what I wanted to say here is it's very difficult as an intensivist to be sure, but patients and families want certainty. So, and what the decision that's made between the family, between the intensivists, between the neurologists and the cardiac team it's shared decision making, but it's important because most of the people are dying because we've, we've decided to withdraw life-sustaining treatments. That's what the WLST stands for. There's a, a small proportion that are unsupportable from cardiogenic shock and multi-organ failure. A small proportion progress to brain death. But a larger, the largest proportion are ones that we've made a prognostic opinion on, we've had a chat to the family, and we've come to the decision that it's not appropriate to continue ICU. So that's why it's important. And our tests are tricky because everyone wants a test that's very, very specific. It will, a test that won't make a mistake and say someone's going to die when they actually survive. So if you survey clinicians, they want 99.9 .9 sensitivity, no, no false positives. But when you set that on your test, it's not very sensitive. So to fast forward a little bit, that's the reason why we do prognostication using a number of different factors. And that's... So we look at their history, we look at some of the early findings, and then we give them do 72 hours at least and do a number of these tests to help. Um, all of these tests are very uh, specific, so they rarely make mistakes, but they're not very sensitive, so they don't pick up everyone that's going to have a poor prognosis. But when you combine lots of non-sensitive tests, then you improve the overall test. <coughs> so... The recommendations now are that you wait 72 hours. If they still have coma, no ongoing effects from hypothermia or sedation, which is a, a or organ failures, and no sepsis or shock. So that's a, that's a fairly big caveat. Um, and they've got a motor score that's abnormal flexion or worse. Then you should do a neuroprognostication with some other tests. <coughs> and if you can get two of these to be true, the chance of having a poor outcome is pretty close to 100%. And then you can say to the family, this is the case, and you can provide a recommendation that we proceed with withdrawing life-sustaining treatment. <clears throat>
<clears throat> so this is a clinical exam, so absent pupil and long corneal reflexes at 72 hours. Interestingly, from a paramedic point of view, and like as a retrieval physician, I've seen quite a few patients with bilateral dilated pupils after ROSC, and everyone's been, oh, it's not gonna go well. <clears throat> and most of those have survived. So like in the first 24 hours, it's quite normal to have fixed dilated pupils and the patient can survive, which is good. Um, this is a uh, SSE, somatosensory evoked potentials. This is sort of a neurological test to work out if you stimulate the median nerve, does the brain recognize it? We also look at EEGs, which is like you do in epilepsy and look at the background activity. If there's no background activity, the brain is likely not working very well. <clears throat> we can measure NSE, which I haven't heard of anyone doing in Australia, but it's out there and it's supposed to be done. Um, but basically that looks at dead, dead neurons release NSE into the circulation. You, you measure a level and it gives you an idea of the magnitude of brain injury. Um, you can also look at myoclonus. So if you have uh, sort of continuous jerking activity, that can be a bad prognostic sign. And then we often rely on CT and MRI, which there's not a lot of evidence to support that as a modality, um, but it is used quite a lot in ICU. And if you have a, a very normal MRI, you would definitely err on the side of caution and probably not recommend withdrawing life support early. But if someone has a terrible MRI with lots of um, dead neurological tissue, well then they've probably got a, a poor prognosis. <coughs> so we make a prediction or a, a best estimate of what the prognosis is and then we speak to the family and they're two separate things and we try and separate those conversations a little bit um, and give people the right idea about what, the be what we think the best thing to is to do and see what their feeling on it is and come to a consensus decision. Um, organ donation after cardiac arrest is um, reasonably common. So patients that progress to brain death, a number of them will be able to be organ donors. And so we'll often have quite long chats with the family about what the patient's wishes would have been, the benefits of organ donation. Um, and, and that's an important um, certainly an important in terms of our organ donation rates in Australia. Um, to reassure people, there's very good guidelines on brain death testing. And there's also a lot of money going into this from the federal government to help support us making the right decision. We have specialist donation nurses that actually speak to families separately from the intensive care team about organ donation, the benefits, the cons, and have a dis spend some, a long time discussing that with them. So I'll touch, I'll probably go a smidge over, but just touch on outcomes in Australia and New Zealand. <clears throat> so this is a quite interesting, if you want to read about outcomes, this is quite a good um, document. So it's only released this year, um, Epidemiology of Cardiac Arrest for 2019, released in 2022. Um, but that looks at all different states around Australia and it's a little comparison graph that I'll show you in a minute. There's also a number of ambulance organisations have a registry. Um, and they publish it and they have beautiful infographics and lots, particularly the Victorian one is looking now at long-term outcomes in cardiac arrest survivors. And so if you're interested in what happens after cardiac arrest, some of these ones are actually even better than, than the, the text version here. Um, so have a look at your local, ask to see your local cardiac arrest registry and, and some of your outcomes. It'll be quite interesting and you'll see, um, quite, you'll learn quite a lot from just seeing how much good work is done in the ambulance service is probably not recognised and not the good w uh, outcomes are probably not celebrated as much as they should be. So overall, um, Australia has actually got a quite high incidence of cardiac arrest. As you'd expect, mostly adults, male, 68, mostly at home. Uh, unwitnessed is a huge number, asystole is a huge number. And both of those are uh, really bad for your cardiac arrest survival rate. Of the witnessed ones, um, oh, I might have made a mistype there. I think the bystander CPR rate is slightly higher, but the, the AED rate is still very, very low. And I think that we've got a long way to go in terms of integrating the thousands of AEDs in the community into being used. And I think that's um, something that really needs to be worked on in the future. <clears throat> if we do start resuscitation, um, this is a sort of pre-hospital resuscitation, 13 to 36% is the average outcome, uh, sort of 30-day survival from ROSC. 
oh, sorry, survival of the event, and then survival of 30 days is 9 to 20%, which sounds quite low, but that includes all of the asystoles, it includes a whole bunch of other um, no bystander CPR. Um, so there's a few things, that's probably the outcomes that you guys might see, but if you look at and you want to compare to other services, use what's called the Utstein definition. And these are the more of the patients that you guys might think, yeah, this guy's got a chance, or this lady's got a chance. Witness cardiac arrest, shockable rhythm, you get them to hospital, and you're starting to look more towards the 40% rate. And if you factor in then on top of that, um, bystander CPR, and a short um, time from, from call to dispatch and arrival, then you start looking at higher percentages. Uh, so this is um, states across the bottom, and this is just the cardiac arrest. And then if you've had an AED, if you factor in all the AED cases that get ROSC before paramedics arrive, that gives you a bit of a boost. So you can see here WA has lots of patients with AEDs are used and are getting a really good cardiac arrest survival rate. Um, and there's a bit of a discrepancy, can't you? Like it's, you could say, oh gee, I don't think poor old New South Wales is not doing very well. <laughs> but in actual fact, um, there's been a number of studies to look at why these differences are there. And in fact, it's actually mostly due to differences in the population. So if you look at uh, regional centres, lower socioeconomic centres, areas with high prevalence of smoking, um, low education about CPR, all of that sort of stuff factors into it way more than the ambulance service. And I think generally all of our ambulance services are very comparable. It's just not reflected in the graph. And, uh, internationally, uh, in, the t in clinical trials, we can get up to at least 50% survival with careful selection and lots of bystander CPR in Europe. Um, AV's got a, it doesn't really project there, but in the city, in a metro, 41% survival for the Utstein definition of cardiac arrest. And overall, around the world, it really does vary, and it depends on your ambulance service as well as all the risk factors I mentioned, but 11 to 47%. But we, in Australia, we really are quite up there in terms of our outcomes. So that's reassuring for people. Um, the, list, the last slide, how the cardiac arrest survivors do. <clears throat> so there's a lot of research, or qualitative research, that cognitive function, lethargy, mental illness, and functional impairment is quite common but that's common in all ICU survivors. <clears throat> so we haven't done much individual follow-up studies of cardiac arrest and Ambulance Victoria is doing 12 month follow-up of all their survivors. So I think that's really reassuring and we're gonna see lots of good data about that coming out soon. But reassuringly, if you survive cardiac arrest, most of you are alive at 12 months. <clears throat> Those that worked mostly returned to work and mostly returned to work in the same job that they were in before. And uh, levels that AV have been finding of anxiety, depression, lethargy are kind of within acceptable limits and kind of similar to normal population and kind of similar to uh, post ICU survivors from other pathologies. So I think overall people should be reassured that we're doing the right thing with our cardiac arrest. Australia's performing very well compared to internationally, but we do have some room to move with AED use and we really need to make sure that as EMS providers, be you a paramedic, be you a retrieval physician, be you a ED nurse, be you an ED doctor, or anyone involved in it essentially. <clears throat> if you keep on top of the literature as it comes through, you can really ask some questions about are we contemporary with our guidelines? And it will help you fill in those gray zones in the guidelines where there's not an answer. It'll help you make the right decision. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike, for that. Ooh. Thank you, Mike, for that uh, very informative, excellent presentation. So, yesterday you guys did awesome. We said um, short break, and you were all back in a really good amount of time. So, same deal again. Let's just try and um, yeah, get the wine glasses filled and bladders empty in about five minutes, and we'll kick things off again. See you shortly.